there was skiffle, and then out of nowhere there's rock and roll, and then out of nowhere there's R and B and the beat boom, and it's not true. You can trace it through a very few people, probably starting as far as my lot are concerned with Chris Barber and Ken Collier, who, who bought Muddy over, you know, and from that. There was all the skiffle groups with Donegan, you know, and his banjo playing interval for the barber band. And then you get Cyril and Alexis playing skiffle together and separately. And then they get into R&B and they get chucked out and end up in Ealing, you know. And that, and that ends up with the Studio 51, which was actually the Ken Collier Jazz Club. You know, and the tragic, the tragedy was we could see it when us and the Stones were started to play at the Studio 51, Ken was still doing, still doing the Sunday afternoons and Sunday, no, he was doing the Sunday evenings. And gradually but gradually you could see all the R&B bands replacing all the jazz bands. And if it hadn't been for Chris and Ken Collier, there wouldn't have been any R&B. And I hated it. I really hated it, you know. There's nothing you could do about it. The tide was... You know, the world was changing, you know. Because at school, Skiffle saved my life. I was at Gunnersbury Grammar, and they were right poncy bastards, a lot of them. Uh, we turned professional six, December 62, but by then we were already playing at the Ealing Club. And we saw Alexis and Art and everybody start to play there on different nights. And I, I quite enjoyed it, but I didn't like it. The sort of R&B and blues to me was the stuff I saw Georgie Fame and everybody play up at the Flamingo. And then Alexis started getting gigs there with Blues Incorporated. And I thought he's a shit guitarist. But as I say, at my school, they were all 15-year-olds were talking about being bank managers and lawyers. And I said, oh, fuck off, I don't want to do anything. And then Donegan came. I thought, wonderful. Because before that, I'd just seen, all loved all the old gangster films, yeah. And I, I noticed that the only people who didn't get shot were the people on stage, unless it was collateral damage. But nobody tended to go up and shoot them. The bad guys would be shooting each other, but the band were fine, you know. And then we still, as a kid, Tommy Steele got famous at the Two Eyes, so I started going up there. And working there, and Suchi was there. Suchi was going out his band for about 15 quid a night. We were getting three pound a night to play in the basement. But then there was a guy called Casey Jones. Great rocker he was. Little guy like me, fucking bundle of energy. And he told me about the Flamingo Club. So we'd play at the Two Eyes on a Saturday night, finish about half 11 then go down to the Flamingo, only about 15 years old. We go down to the Flamingo and, and uh, Johnny Gunnell, the younger brother, would be on the door. And uh, he knew we were playing at the tour. Musicians come in free, say, and we pass all these Stone West Indians and everybody, a huge queue, and get in. And that's that started to watch Georgie Fame and all that. They, they were doing Ray Charles stuff mainly after coming off uh, Billy Fury's backing group originally, and then it became Earl Watson and the Blue Flames. I think Earl Watson was a sax player. Big trouble there one night, a couple of people got stabbed, got nasty. Following week, it was Georgie Fame and the Blue Flames. 